Amen. If you take your Bibles, thank you, Leon, and ter- take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 91. Psalm 91. We were in Psalm 90 and uh, last week, and uh, we're going to spend some time here in the Psalms during this time, taking a little hiatus from what we were doing. And I uh, just want to be an encouragement, and I'm thankful for the scriptures that are encouragement, and uh, I'm thankful that uh, God's Word is what is able to get us through. So Psalm 91, and I'm going to read the whole psalm here, and it's one of my favorite psalms, and we're going to look at what the Bible says here in Psalm 91. The Bible says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid of the terror for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shall thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall, thou, uh, they shall bear thee up in the, thy hand, lest thy dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, and the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble, and I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Lord, I pray that you'd help us as we look at this psalm, Lord, that we might be encouraged by it. Lord, that we might be strengthened by the knowledge of your ability and your power. Lord, in your sovereignty and your goodness, Lord, and I pray that you would help us tonight, that we might be encouraged by the message, and we thank you for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. In Psalm 91, this declaration of the power of God. Now, let me, let me say some things before we get started. When you read this psalm, this is not a psalm that can just be cut and pasted into your current situation, carte blanche, however you want. You can't say, um, I'm driving to church tonight. Well, I I guess I could say I was driving to church tonight. Uh, You can't say you're driving to work tomorrow. And because I trust in the Lord, uh, there is no way that I'm going to get into an accident. There's no way that something bad couldn't happen. Ultimately, this is a messianic psalm. This is a psalm that is prophetically talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, This will be the psalm uh, that is partly quoted when the Bible talks about his angels giving charge over and and when the devil is tempting Jesus. And certainly it could not be said of Jesus' life that it was void of any difficulty, void of any trouble. But it also could be said of Jesus' life that he dwelled, his habitation was in the Most High. He dwelt in the secret place of the Most High. So this is not just a... um, Uh, a a gimmick psalm where you can say, nothing bad can happen to me because God is my uh, God. But what you can say, what it is possible to say, is I do not have to fear because I know God is in control. I know God is in control. This is not the absence of the reality of physical difficulty or, or, or ultimately Death, this is a declaration of nothing can happen to me outside of God's allowance. Now, but there is a difference here. There is those things that God will allow and those things that uh, happen to us either when we're dwelling with the Lord in, in his habitation 
or we're fleeing from the Lord. If we are fleeing from the Lord, it's also possible that the, um, the consequences of our very actions are negative to our very person. Okay? The consequences of our actions are negative to our person. Uh, we know this just in, in a normal physical way. If you're, if you're driving a vehicle, if you're being cautious as a driver and you're doing the speed limit and you're being observant, and, and it's less likely for you to be in an accident than if you are you know, eating a hamburger and doing your fingernails and putting mascara on and texting three people. Okay? Uh, it's far more likely for you to bear the negative results of your actions uh, if not, and it's possible for all you to be doing all those things and not get into an accident, but I wouldn't want to press my chances, right? But obviously, if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, the likelihood is less. And so this is not talking about this is a, a gimmick to get out of trouble. This is not talking about a gimmick to avoid difficulty. This is not talking about the avoidance of difficulty, this is talking about the pleasure of walking in habitation with your God. Isn't it funny how we often think of the benefits? But if I walk with God, what's the benefits? You know, and, and praise the Lord, there are benefits that come from being content with God and, 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 and being obedient to God. But the greatest benefit is being with God. And so he will uh, mention this in, in the verse number one, and four names for God will be used here to kind of give this pillar. He, he, this backdrop of the Psalms is he is journeying through a dangerous wilderness. He is journeying through a dangerous wilderness, and there are those things and individuals that are out to get him. It's better to travel within the habitation of the Lord than travel uh, 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 disobediently from the Lord or on your own. And so he kind of gives this picture. Think of these four pillars of God's habitation for those that are humble and, ha and use him for habitation. Look what it says in verse number one. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. The name for the God being the Most High is Elyon. It is his it is his political name, meaning that David's throne is God's by right. That he is, his, he is the one that has the authority to be in charge. And this is talking in a temporal sense. This is talking about on the earthly throne. I hope you realize this, that God is not just sovereign over heaven. God is sovereign over what happens right now. Okay? He is in the position as the Most High to sit on David's throne and to rule and to reign. And ultimately, this Messianic Psalm even goes to the point when Christ physically will sit on that throne. And so he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Shaddai, uh, Shaddai is the name for the Almighty. And not only does it talk about the shadow of Shaddai, it also talks about his almighty power, his encompassing power. And so here he is positionally has the authority, but he also, it's not just a positional authority, it's also an actual authority. Have you ever seen those people that try to use their authority purely based upon their position? You know, they, they don't ooze off authority. They're not somebody that you're like, Oh man, I should really listen to them. But you have to listen to them because of the position they hold. Well, God is more than just a position holder. He is worthy of the position. Okay, he is, he is the most high. He is sitting on David's throne. He is also the El Shaddai, the Almighty, the one that has the power to cast that shadow. And obviously it is greater than the sun. This is the, the backdrop of the habitation. Then he goes on to say, I will say unto the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him will I trust. So not only is it the Most High, Elyon, and not only is it the Almighty, El Shaddai, a Shaddai, it is also Jehovah, the Lord Jehovah. Jehovah is that personal God, and it says that he is my refuge and my fortress, and this is the important thing about this habitation. 
We think of this habitation in a, in a protective sense. And, and let me just tell you, God can protect his own. In fact, God has promised to protect his own in the most important way. When Jesus says, those that the Father have given unto me, I know I shall be cast out. Man, no man can pluck them from my Father's hand. There is an eternal security in knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. But this is not, we think of that with that external benefit. Man, I'm not going to be affected by my externals. God's going to direct me. God's going to lead me. God's going to protect me. And praise the Lord that he is able. Nothing will come into our life that he does not allow. I remember reading someplace that God does not give you anything more than you can handle. Um, I don't know who said that, but they don't know what they're talking, uh, talking about. God won't give you anything more than he can handle. And so we, we see that almighty positional power, Shaddai, actual power, Jehovah, where you almost take it where he turns to us, personal. He is my refuge and my fortress. So you think of God, if we were here in church tonight, if all of you were here, I'd grab a bunch of people and do an illustration. So you have those, God is directive, he is protective for those things that are coming out. But God is not just have his back to you to protect you. God also has turned to you. And Jehovah is the personal relationship, the personal name for God. And so he is the one that is extending to us himself. He is my refuge and my fortress. He is the one that I can depend upon. He is the one that I can care for. Not only is he directing my path, he is also spending time with me. He is my Jehovah, my refuge, and my fortress. Then it says, my God, and whom will I trust? God, the, the official name for God, Elohim. Elohim is that name that means that he is the eternal God. And he is the one that is able to direct. So you can kind of see this. And in fact, the, the, the word that is used here a little bit later says in verse number four, that in his truth shall be my shield and buckler. We think of that shield like, a, you know, whether you think about it, you see it on a movie, that, that shield that protects the front. But this word for shield has the idea of all encompassing. Like, like, think like force field, you know, it's all encompassing. That he is my habitation. There is no place where I am vulnerable without his allowance. But more importantly, there is no place that I can turn where that I cannot be able to acknowledge his person. That he is my habitation, my dwelling place. And it says in verse number one, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. You see, this is not something that God imposes upon us. This is something that has been invited for us. That we can have such a relationship with God. The Bible says in 1 John that God is light and in Him is no darkness in, at all. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, that's when we have fellowship. One with another, we have fellowship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, that we can have God as our habitation. Now, the writer of the psalm has this perspective. When I have God as my habitation, when he is the defense for what I face, and he is also the person with whom I dwell, bring it. I mean, that's his attitude. Bring it. No problem. Okay? He's, and he says this, he says, and it says, surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. Surely. In other words, there is a confidence to knowing that God is your habitation with, where, with whom we dwell. That he is uh, not only David sitting on David's throne, Elyon. He's not only Shaddai. He's not only Jehovah. But he is also Elohim. And he is all these things at one time for he who dwelleth with him. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah, who dwelleth with the Most High, but he that is of a humble and contrite spirit. In order to have this habitation, this dwelling, there must be a willing to recognize not only his positional authority, but also his personal care 
but also his right to direct and to lead our lives. In other words, you, you have to be willing to let him be in charge. Because I can step away. I can run and do my own thing. I can, I, I can scatter. This is the story between David and Saul. Both of them had wrongs and both of them had rights. But in the point of difficulty, David ran to the Lord and turned to the Lord. And Saul ran from the Lord. Saul said, surely, basically, now God is my enemy. And so he began to try to operate outside of the provision of God and the protection of God, so much so that he would need to later go to another source of power when he would go to the witch of Endor trying to speak to Samuel again because he could not find any fellowship with his God. And this is... This is a volitional thing where we choose to be in, this, in the secret place. We choose to submit, submit ourselves and subject ourselves to the person of God. Well, preacher, how do I do that? How, how do I yield myself? Well, ultimately, it's going to come by prayer. Ultimately, it's going to come by willing communication, both back and forth. In a conversation, it is a two-way way of communicating where we issue our desires to God and then God directs how we need to change so that we can spend time in fellowship with Him. It is a depiction of holiness. Look at the example that is given now in verse number. He goes through, he says, hey, listen, He's going to protect me from these things because I dwell with Him. But He says this in verse number 9. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways, and they shall bear, thee, uh, bear thy hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. The picture that is given here, here's the picture, that when Jesus is on the earth, he is living out this psalm exactly, doing his father's business, doesn't mean that he was outside of opposition, doesn't mean that he didn't face tragedy and heartache. And we know from the story of Lazarus, and we know from overlooking Jerusalem, and we know from the activity of Judas, he didn't avoid all of the trouble. But his contentment was in his fellowship that he had with the Lord. In fact, you can see in that Garden of Gethsemane, when he prays, the, the cup, this is my personal belief, the cup that he's being asked, if it, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. It is the breaking of this fellowship, the stepping out of this habitation so that the wrath of God can be poured out upon him so that he can bear the sin of all mankind. He says, he is the one caring. Jesus is indicative of walking in this habitation. He says in verse number 14, Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on by because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. See, this is what is important in this, this psalm. This, the only thing I want you to get tonight is this relationship that we have with the Lord. This relationship is not religious. This relationship is not obligatory. This relationship is not cultural, and this relationship is not hereditary based. This relationship is personal. Amen. It's personal. He says, I have loved thee. And just like he's speaking to Christ, I have loved thee because he is the first begotten. He also loves me because I've also been begotten. And so this is a personal relationship. And so here the psalmist, as he begins to go through this desert wilderness, as he begins to make this dangerous journey, he said, you know where I want to be? I want to dwell in the secret place of the Most High, under the shadow of the Almighty, because Jehovah God, Jehovah is my refuge and my fortress, and I can trust in Elohim. He says, now this is not, this is a personal relationship and God extends himself back to us as we extend ourselves to him. Take your Bibles and turn to James. It's a passage that has been much on, our, on my brain lately. James in chapter number four. You can kind of see this illustrated. 
You can see it illustrated here in James 4. The initial position is a position of a of, of failure. In James chapter 4, he, he, we're being drawn away by lust and, and worldliness that is within. And, and we're being enticed. So much so that our identification in verse number 4 is ye adulterers and adulteresses. Know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore shall be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Do you think the scripture saith in vain that the spirit dwelleth in us, lusteth to enemy, envy? So you have this pool. Where are you going to set up your habitation? Are you going to allow yourself to be pulled away by your own lust and set up your habitation within that worldly desire? Or are you going to deny that and set up your habitation in the presence of the Lord? He says this in verse number six, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee to, from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning. Let your joy to heaviness. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift thee up. Hey, God's habitation is high and lifted up. How could I, lonely as I am, adulterer, adulteress, spiritual adulterer, spiritual adulteress, how could I ever dwell with him? Even within me, I'm drawn away from him. And he says, here's how you do it. You recognize that, 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 that which is in you lusteth after envy. You resist the devil. You resist the flesh. And you draw nigh unto God. You submit yourself unto God. Accept His grace through your humility. And when you resist Him, draw, and He will draw nigh unto you. As you come to the Lord, He will come to you. It is personal. A lot of times we think it's purely transactional. The sin that I keep committing is detrimental to my family. It's detrimental to, to what's going on. It, it's detrimental to my spirit. I wish that you could overcome this sin. I wish I could just stop this sin. I wish I wasn't this way. And it's very transactional. I just don't want to be this. And really, that's not the purpose to overcome sin. The purpose to overcome sin is not so that you'll have a hunky-dory life. The purpose to overcome sin is to dwell with the Lord who is most high, right? And so when we submit to the Lord and we draw nigh unto the Lord, he's going to point out that sin and we're going to have to cleanse our sin. And then when we've humbled ourselves, then he will lift us up to dwell with him in, in habitation with him. The great benefit of denying sin and overcoming sin is not avoiding the repercussions of sin is walking in a personal relationship with God. It's personal. And in order for that to take place, there has to be a desire to do more than just to avoid sin. Do more than just, oh, that would be bad for my family. Oh, that'd be bad for my marriage. Oh, that would be uh, bad for my public image. It's got to be more than that. That's not a convincing enough reason to avoid sin because even inside you, you're drawn away by your own lust. The reason to avoid sin is because we want to dwell, humbly dwell in the habitation of the Lord. We can't get there on our own. We have to humble ourselves, accept His grace. And when, we, when He shows us those things, we have to cleanse it might take some tears. It might take some mourning. It might take some redirecting. It might take some recommitment. It might take some resurrendering. But when we submit to the Lord, the Bible tells us in verse number 11, uh, verse number, uh, verse number uh, 10, I'm sorry, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. So here's this illustration. Elyon, the Lord who has the authority to sit there, is able to care and able to direct. And not only that, the Shaddai Almighty, nothing can come into his presence that he cannot overcome and handle. This is a, this is a beautiful relationship to travel through the wilderness in. And here's Jehovah, my refuge and my fortress, with an invitation to come and dwell in the secret place of the Most High. But how do I, the most lowly, get to the most high. 
I have to humble myself. Cleanse my hands. Submit myself unto God. Resist the devil. And then God will lift me up. And he will do it. I will do it in his sight. It is a personal relationship. You see, God is the protector. God is the director. God is the determiner. God is the direction maker. But that's what God is doing in that way. But at the same time, he's turning personally to us and saying, if you would like to travel with me, then you're going to have to humble yourself. In order for you to be lifted up, you're going to have to humble yourself. And this is personal. So when we think about all the things that we're going through, we're going through difficulty and there's a lot of fear and there's a lot of anxiety and you're like, oh, if I could just, if this could happen or if this wouldn't happen, can I tell you the most important thing to take away from this? That God wants to have a personal relationship with each and every one of us. A personal relationship. Not a religious relationship. Not a transactory relationship. Not a if you, then I. But a personal relationship that he is God. He is the one who sits on the throne. He is the Almighty. He is the refuge. He is the fortress. He is the uh, uh, supreme one. And I submit to him. And in his sight, he's waiting for me to humble myself. And he'll give me grace. He's waiting for me to resist the devil and submit myself unto him. He's waiting for me to cleanse my hands, to, to recognize me for who I am. And when I humble myself, then he will lift me up. Man, what a personal... Uh, the fact that we could even have a relationship with God. But a personal relationship with God. You know, I was just thinking tonight, it's not... This is not the relationship for the spiritually mighty. This is a relationship for the spiritually humble. This is not the relationship for the spiritually experienced. This is not the relationship uh, for the people who know it all or have done it all. This is a relationship for the spiritually humble. How far in your walk do you have to go before you can be humble? You know, in fact, it takes a lot of humility to accept Christ as your Savior. And so that was the point where we recognize our ability to accept the provision of God and respond in personal humility. Well, I'm just not smart enough to do that. I'm not uh, spiritual enough to do that. I'm not wise enough to do that. Those are, none of those are the qualifications. The qualification is, are you humble enough to desire a personal relationship with God where He is supreme and He lifts you up to Him instead of expecting Him to be created in your image, you submit to the fact that you are being changed into His. The qualification for dwelling with the Most High is humility. And oftentimes we, we, we don't do a good job as setting that as the qualification. We make all these other expectations. Well, surely they couldn't be dwelling with the Most High. They don't have this or they don't have that. Actually, the qualification is humility, acceptance of God's grace, letting God's grace direct the next step, humbling yourself, and then God actually does the work. I'm thankful that God does not look for the mighty. He looks for the humble. He doesn't look for the great. He looks for the weak. And then he brings them up to him and says, He who dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. Man, to have Jehovah, God, as your refuge and your fortress. He says in Psalm 91 that we can rest underneath his wings. How You don't get much more personal than that hen who protects the chicks in the midst of the difficulty. And that's the kind of personal God that He wants to be with us. Hey, much less than the midst of difficulty. But let's be honest, life is difficult. And so it is, that's how God would have us travel in a personal relationship surrounded by the presence of Himself. Lord, I pray that You'd help us.